Hi, I'm Mindy Stearns, and to know him, well, is to love him. He's a CEO, entrepreneur, outlier, overcomer, father, brother, underdog. I'm talking about, that's right, my husband, Glenn Stearns, and this is... It's his podcast, and no. I'm here too. Great happens. Start to get used to this. You are. Right? You love. Yes. I know. I'm not going to say this at night. every night. Please, guess it's coming to bed. It's great, great happens. Happen. No. <laughs> no. Well, I am excited about our guest today. It's our first too. time we've had an in-studio guest. And yes, so in I'm, your podcast, it is. This is right. true. And what an honor! What what an honor to have you with us. That's right. So you want to give the intro? Well, I will start. Okay. Okay. So first I met Captain Charlie Plum about 10 years ago. Somewhere Something around like there, that. somewhere. And um, now Charlie has uh, an amazing story that I'm not going, I'm going to try to not give it all away. But I mean, being one of the longer captive POWs at the Hanoi Hilton. Um, Six years. And right. what you went through and what you learned is really a lot about what this whole podcast has been all about grit and determination and resilience and how you get your mind right you know and so there's so many people out there charlie that want to understand how do i break out of what i'm doing every day how do i start a business how do i kind of change my behavior and so that's where a lot of this podcast has come from because as you might know, I did a little show a while ago, and, and then I've had so many people reaching out asking for those kind of tips. And so I said, well, I've got a few stories, but I've got a lot of friends with a few stories as well. And so why don't we uh, maybe try to bring all that together and, and show other people how they can get off the couch or how they can change their life or change their their uh, their mindset. Minds to, their mindset, exactly. And so we're excited to have you and tell a lot about your story and um, at least kind of give people some understanding of what it takes to really get outside of your own way, you know, and, and, and succeed, so to speak. So I'd like to welcome, just formally, Captain Charlie Plum. Could we please get a big round of applause for oh, this incredible, you, thank you, thank you. you have uh, <laughs> you. a POW Talks About on your LinkedIn page. And I don't think anyone knows more about quarantine than you. And, you know, we've talked a couple of times and you say toilet paper. What toilet paper? <laughs> COVID-19? Are you kidding me? I've had the multitudes of diseases. And, you know, you have been through so you've been through something like I would say 99.9 um, percent .9 of Americans and global citizens right now walking the planet have not experienced. And so we want to kind of go down the path of your perspective on life and and. Why we're well, here, thank Mel. you very much, and I'm flattered to be here, Mindy and Glenn, my good friends, <laughs> and uh, I pr would probably agree with it, 99 point something where they have not done this, but I think everybody has felt some of the same th things that I have felt, and Glenn has felt in your life story, you've had disappointments, you know, you've, you've been the underdog, you know, even more times than on TV, you've been underdog. <laughs> That's right. And uh, and so, but I haven't been locked in a six foot cell for six years. Well, that's probably true. But you know, the emotions of of frustration, of loneliness, of failure, you Isolation. know, to succeed, uh, cut off from your support group, uh, lack of communication. All these things are the things that that bothered me during the six years that I was a prisoner of war, and it bothers everybody else when we go through these things. So my approach is it's not really what happens to you. It's how you respond mm -hmm. to what happens to you, and that's right out of your playbook. Yeah. So I, I, and, and I, I, I'm so happy to be here because you're one of my heroes and some of the Aww. things you've gone uh, through. Charlie, I mean, we've done a lot together, and I've, I've – you know, had you at my 50th birthday, you got the biggest standing ovation there. And, <laughs> you really you know, are. And, and there's so, so many deeply times respected. That, yeah, that, that I've really been proud to have you uh, and Susan as part of our lives. So we're, we're really excited. Glenn, um, one of Glenn's favorite stories, I have to say, that he uses this over and over um, because it was such a profound um, picture, if you were, analogy about what people go through. And you talk about this 8x8 eight eight cell that you are 6x6. Six six, can how, you tell a little of that? I, I, can you talk about that? Because I think that's such a powerful perspective. Sure. Uh, I was an F-4 pilot uh, flying off aircraft carrier, shot down uh, on my 75th combat mission just five days before I was uh, supposed to go home uh, to my wife and, uh, and loved ones back here. 
um, ejected from that F four Phantom, tortured for two days, and put into a cell that was eight feet long and eight feet wide. And I could pace three steps one way, turn around, pace three steps the other. <laughs> that was going to be my life for the next two thousand one hundred and three oh. days. Oh. Wow. So, um, but who's counting, right? <laughs> no, no one in here. Oh, wow. Uh, that turned out to be uh, age 24 to age 30. Uh, I had six wow. birthdays, six Christmases, uh, all of the things that we enjoy in life. I had six of them uh, without family or friends. Well, I did have friends, the other POWs. But uh, a little bit about the, the, you know, the commonalities between my isolation and the isolation that, that we've are going through and have been through, and the, and kind of the challenges that that you've been through, Glenn, is uh, you know when you get cut off from the rest of the world, you start you start searching for things. You look for foundations. You know you f- you try to find something to hold on to. And so, I was in solitary confinement all alone for I don't know several weeks, not nearly as long as a lot of guys. Some guys were there for four and a half years. Solitary confinement. In solitary confinement, four and a half years. In fact, Jeremiah Denton has the record. He came back and became a U.S. senator and an admiral, and so he did quite, quite well, as we all have done. You know, that, and that's another story. The POWs have emerged from that experience just with great success. And what you said about that once to me was everyone that was there for a longer period of time seemed to have done a lot better than the ones that just got there at the very end. That's an amazing thing. Uh, a study was done of all the uh, the combatants of Vietnam, and 30.6% have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, the POWs, only 4% of us have PTSD, and most of those are the guys that were only shot down late in the war and were only prisoners of war for a few weeks or a month or two. And so it almost seemed like the longer you were there, you know, the more time you had to learn the lesson of mm-hmm. grit. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Well, there's a process you go through, I think, that you have to really, you either succumb or you overcome. I and think that's true, you know, and, and true in a lot of life's issues. You know, you either get bitter about it or you get better about it. So mm-hmm. you, you're either, uh, you, you know, a, a, a hero or you just crawl over in the corner and, and atrophy and die on the vine. So. You know, and, and I've, uh, again, because a lot of people that are listening are people just wanting to learn either a new business or wanting to change their, their you know, their behavior in some way. And, again, we just talked about how it takes that first step, right? And, um, you know, you came out and have done so well. Again, like you said, most of the POWs came out and did really well with this whole thing. But when you came out, it wasn't exactly roses, was it? I mean, you had this uh, wife and you had a life that was waiting for you, so to speak. And and what happened? I had married my high school sweetheart the day after I graduated from Annapolis. And she hung on for five years. Uh, Three months before I came home, she filed for divorce. She gave up on me and was engaged to be mm-hmm. married to another guy. Oh. So, so, And I did not know this, of course. And so I had planned the rest of my life around her. It, that was one of the exercises that I did in the prison camp. I would fast forward my mind about an hour a day just to be with her mentally. I planned the next 20 years. I knew every birthday, the gifts, the wrapping, the ribbon, Christmases, ornaments on trees. I planned this day by day for 20 years. Wow. And that took several months. And when I wasn't home and couldn't put that plan into action, I went back through uh, the plan. And, and, and I planned a different way. So the first way, you know, was going to be four kids and stay in the military in a big home and a big car. The second way was going to, was, you like this, was going to be uh, live on a sailboat with two kids. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me I know which way you went. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the sad news was when I came back, I couldn't put those plans into action because they, they were all around her. Yeah. And that's when you run into Plan B. <laughs> plan B. We have talked We've about talked Plan about B. We've talked about Plan B. Plan B. Yeah. It's so important to realize that I think all of us need a plan B because it, life doesn't go exactly the way we plan it Absolutely. ever. Absolutely. And I think like getting into business and, and I've gotten into a couple of businesses myself and you know better than anybody that if you don't have a plan B, you know, you're probably not going to make it uh, because right. it never goes the way you plan. Never. 
and you know and sometimes you're just winging plan b and that's okay but as long as you don't sit in the corner like you said and that's right. become the victim then uh you know you'll you'll figure a way out what was um what do you think it was about being in that eight foot cell um that because you say something the very powerful about about being it wasn't the eight feet in there you know yeah I, well absolutely I, I found and it took several months to figure this out was that the restriction of a prisoner of war is not the eight feet between the walls it was the eight inches between my ears okay <laughs> it was a mental box and this is going to be a mental game and so many things in life you know are like that we assume you know that that, that we've got this terrible restriction you know, we got this, this COVID-19 going on, and, and, and we've got all these bad, bad things happening to us. But if you set your mind to it and you get creative and you stick with it, uh, you find solutions to it. That's right. So eight so, inches or eight feet, which, uh, which prison do you want to be in? Wow. Exactly. So such a powerful visual for what I think a lot of people are going through. And, you know, a lot of the generation now hasn't been through a war or been through any kind of adversity. So, uh, I mean, people are, thank goodness for social media and able to stay in contact. And I love that we get your lessons through LinkedIn and some of your, you talk about resilience, you talk about toilet paper. I mean, people <laughs> are losing their minds over toilet paper. And you say, well, I, yeah, you want to talk about toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, there's a kind well, of a... then there's and you know, and then you've got the whole side. I think in any thing in life or business, there's a forgiveness side too to all Ooh. this. Ooh. And, yeah, and let's talk is, a little bit about that forgiveness. is major. My my mother was a saint. I would put her up against Mother Teresa any day. Aww. You know, she, you know, and all the years that I that I knew my mother, I never heard her complain about anybody. She just did did not have that in her heart. She, uh, she forgave everybody of everything. And she passed. She tried to pass that along to me, but it's not easy, you uh -huh. know, when people do you that way. So in the prison camp, I found myself early on blaming everybody for my problem and feeling sorry for myself. And the air, you know, the the president started this war, and the the mechanic put that airplane together. The enemy signed that Geneva Convention. They're torturing prisoners. That's not fair. I'm the victim of circumstances beyond my control. Well, that took about. I don't know, three or four months, I had that, my, that was my mindset, okay? And then I got this message in the wall. I was uh, tugging on a wire in the secret code that we had. And, and, and I got this, we passed around patriotic quotes and, and we passed around poetry and Bible verses and, and this quote came through. And the quote is this, acid does more harm in the vessel it's stored than on the subject it's poured. What that meant to me was the acid within me, I can spit that out, but it's still going to do more harm to me just to have that vitriol within me right. than it does on the enemy that I'm spitting the acid on. Mm. And so, and, and it became very clear to me that I could, I could actually kill myself in that prison camp just by the anger that I had within me. It's corrosive, so, very corrosive. And, and, and my, my mom's words came back, you know, forgive forgive everybody. There's good in everybody, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and forgive whatever action. And I try to live my life that that way, and it really is a, it's a much easier way to live your life. You know, when, when somebody <laughs> cuts you off in the, in the highway, you know, and you're waving your fist and you're yelling all kinds of obscenities towards them, that person doesn't even know. They're just driving on down the road. You know, they, they, that's right. The only person you're hurting is yourself. <laughs> and a lot of times people don't realize the infraction they cause upon others or the pain. That's and, true. Uh, you know, and so speaking of that, sorry to cut you off. No. That'll be an infraction. I'll get later in the, no. the bedroom. But you know, uh, I usually it's me doing the same. So, honey, touche. <laughs> so, with that said, um, you know, then you fast forward. I don't know about forty years, and you. Uh, go back to that Hanoi Hilton, same I did. Uh, jail that, uh, that or same uh, camp, whatever you want to call it, um, that John McCain was, just for those that, that didn't know that. And uh, you revisit it. And because uh, we were there last year and we saw your star, the the, um, the, the dollar, dollar star stars. That My wife Susan made that star. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And <laughs> we saw that and some pictures in there of you. But in the gift shop, there was something that reminded you still of the past, wasn't there? There was, as a matter of fact. I had uh, told this story. Well, 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 back up just a little bit. Uh, my trip back to Vietnam uh, was one something I really didn't want to do. Uh, they asked me, and I refused. They asked me again, come on back to Vietnam, you know. 
it was primarily a professor who was uh, head of the uh, history department at University of Hanoi. And he wanted me to come back, do a little uh, story on me meeting the camp commi- the, the, the enemy in charge of the prison camp and the fighter pilots I'd fought against. And so I didn't want to go. Finally, he said, well, bring your wife and kids and we'll make a family vacation out of it. Okay. So I took uh, Susan and uh, three of our four kids uh, back to Vietnam. And I met with the camp, the, the camp commander. And it was really interesting because th- they, they told me this guy was in his 80s and didn't have too long to live. And I thought he might, you know, he might have, uh, be remorseful. Softened yeah, he, and remorseful. Yeah, he, he might even apologize. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, nothing could be farther from the truth. Really? Now, he was very nice. Uh, I went into his home. He offered me his homemade beer. That was interesting. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't bad beer, actually. But his first words to me were, um, I am proud to have been your warden from 1968 to 1972, and my proudest achievement was keeping you healthy and happy while you were here. That was his perspective. Uh, yeah, that was his perspective. Wow. Denial and, uh, much? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> now, don't you recognize it? Yeah, Bubba, it's me. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that te- seemed to be true for everybody we met in Vietnam. The uh, cab drivers and the waitresses, and uh, these, a lot of them speak English there. I spoke uh, at the university, at the embassy. I went to the embassy. Uh, and everybody, every Vietnamese I met did not know that American captives were tortured in the prison camps. Mm. And so the last day I was there, I'd sent uh, Susan and the kids went home. And uh, I was in a park, uh, just wandering around this park. And it was a lady selling postcards in a park. Had a bag over her shoulder and want to buy a postcard? Wanna buy? And the first thing I noticed was she spoke excellent English, just really fine English. The second thing I noticed was she was missing her entire right leg was gone. Oh. And, and she had her, you know, they wear black pajamas there, and they were in a knot in that leg. And she's on crutches, selling a postcard. Where do I have a postcard? I said, okay, I'll buy a postcard, but I want to know your story. She was flattered that I wanted to know her story. Mm. And, and so, so we sat down on a park bench together, and I said, how'd you lose your leg? She said, linebacker two. Linebacker two was the, the secret code for the B-52 bombings at, that ended the war, the Christmas bombings of 1972. Uh, but, but, but it wasn't something that a civilian would necessarily know. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, why didn't she call it an air raid, you know, or, right. or mm-hmm. a, a bomb blew up or something, but linebacker too. <laughs> now I'm really wondering who she is, you know, and if this is the truth. And I said, okay, what, what day did, did it happen? She said, uh, 24 December 1972. Yep, that was linebacker too. So wow. we talked for a while, and, and, uh, and, I, and I said to her, I said, um, y- y- you speak excellent English. You're out here selling postcards. Well, you, you could be a, a docent at, at one of the museums. You could be an interpreter. Oh, no. She said, she said no, my, 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 my uh, leaders of the country would never give me a permit. They would never have an invalid, you know, serving in a capacity like that. So we've got two Two people on the same park bench, about the same age, about the same mentality. Uh, she was she was certainly as, as as intelligent as I am, and 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 one of them has two airplanes and a, and a, and a sailboat and lives in a great big house and a big car, uh, and the other is eking out a living selling postcards, postcards in a park. <laughs> wow. And the only difference, the only difference to me is I live in a society where you can make dreams come true. Right. And she didn't. No. Her communist, the communist way, just does not uh, allow that. You know, and, and, and an invalid in the United States, um, a victim of the war in the United States, has all kinds of opportunities and benefits, and she did not. Well, finally, she said, "You're about my age." She said, "Where were you in um, Christmas of '72?" And I said, "I was right here with you." She said, "You were a prisoner of war." I said, yes, I was a prisoner of war. She said, uh, uh, she said, well, you look pretty good. I said, yeah, I feel pretty good. I said, but let me ask you this question. Do you think the prisoners of war were tortured? Oh, no. She said, absolutely not. She said, in fact, the prisoners got more medical care and better food than we did. 
I said, how do you know that? She said, oh, she said, documentaries. The government mm-hmm. shows us documentaries. That's how I know. Interesting. <laughs> Isn't that it? Propaganda. <laughs> sure yep. is. A little yep. bit of propaganda. We've been to that um, museum a couple mm-hmm. times. Yep. It's, a, it's a definitely it's a different It's very hard um, to see, knowing this view. viewpoint that we have on it. It's mm-hmm. a very different spin there in their museums and in their... In their historical account of, Truly you know, is. there's pictures of you smiling and there's pictures oh, of you yeah. playing basketball oh, and playing beer. cards. Yeah. And they were like, smile. Weren't they saying smile for the oh, picture? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But guys were tortured to make some of those pictures. Oh. It was, uh, you know, you had to do it. You know, there's so. a, you wrote a book called I'm No Hero, and mm-hmm. it's a compelling look at some of the inside experiences you have. I know it's available on Amazon. I think people can get that. And. Actually, I autograph it if they buy it off my website. Oh, so well, there you go. I autograph every Website copy is charlieplum.com. Charlieplum with a B dot mm-hmm. com. Yep. Charlieplum with a B dot com. Mm-hmm. And then also, um, here's something. You brought us a gift. And I. this is one of my favorite stories. Two things. A, I'm wearing this bracelet, which you had gifted us, which was a something that the women, the wives of... Uh, soldiers made to bring their their prisoners You've had home. that on for I've had this weeks. on for a few weeks and it's got your uh, your name and the, and the date of I think when you 5 1967 is that they when were you shot went down, down? Mm-hmm. and uh, the women people would wear these they would sell these t- and you didn't take it off until your prisoner came home that yeah that was a plan it was a, an organization called uh, voices in vital America the deal was uh, we our wives were to- shot down to maintain total secrecy, not ever tell anybody about their husband. Wow. Uh, they told our wives that if they if, if they did an interview uh, in a newspaper or even told a neighbor that it might go bad on us, that the, the enemy would torture us oh. because of what our, our wives were saying. And so the wives were zip lip, and they were saying nothing for a long time. And that got pretty old. And then they found out that we were being tortured, and the, and the government wasn't doing anything about it. So the wives organized, and this is a great story of heroism, and, and uh, against the government, you know, uh, Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State at the time, said, those ladies are a thorn in my side Oof. because, you know, it was people trying to get something done that the government couldn't do. And so, and so uh, but they, they did. So they sold the bracelets, and, and they uh, traveled to foreign uh, uh, countries. They went to embassies and consulates around the world to ask those countries to put pressure on the North Vietnamese to stop torturing their husbands. And it worked. It worked. Wow. It, worked. Oh, it was amazing. That shows you, and you have a power and a purpose and, Absolutely. and it was, a pack. It, just an amazing story that, that hasn't been told that, because, you know, in a lot of ways, they were the heroes. Um, so that was, the, that was the reason for the bracelets. It funded that, that effort. We didn't know anything about it. I remember the POW bracelets. Well, I'm going to keep kid. this on until we get out of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. well, I don't yeah. know when, but yeah. <laughs> but also speaking of the power and purpose in a pack, I here's you just gifted us something that says parachute packer. Parachute There's an incredible story. Will you please tell the story of the parachute packer? I love this. story. I gave that to you because you are in fact a parachute packer, oh. Mindy, like like no other, <laughs> isn't she? Glenn? True, it, she it is really no, is. no question. <laughs> I could tell that story. Okay, so here's the story. Uh, several years after I came home, okay, I'm in a restaurant in Kansas City where I used to live. A uh, guy about two tables over kept looking at me, and I caught his eye, but I didn't recognize this guy. He stood up, walked over to our table, pointed at me, and he said, you're Captain Plum. I said, well, yes, sir, I'm Captain Plum. He said, you're that guy, very stern look on his face, very serious. You're that guy. You flew jet fighters in Vietnam. You're a fighter pilot. You, know, you, you were top, part of that Top Gun outfit in <laughs> California. You, you, shot, you, were, you, were, you were shot down. You parachuted into enemy hands. You spent six years as a prisoner of war. Were you going, what's this guy? Yeah, how exactly. does he know yeah, so yeah, much? Exactly. I'm thinking, how, did, how in the world did <laughs> you know that? He said, because I'm the guy that packed your parachute. Oh. Wow. Isn't wow. that yeah. amazing? So, of course, I was speechless, you know. Wow. The best I could do was stagger to my feet, reach out a very grateful hand of thanks. Mm. I couldn't, sp- he could. He, he, he came up with the proper words. He's, he said, he grabbed my hand, he pumped my arm, he said, I guess it worked. profound word but you have a kind of a metaphor for that in life well it is well in fact he gave me the metaphor you know we talked late that into night you know and he said i'm not i'm not the only guy that packed your parachute i just packed the physical one he said what allowed you to survive 
were the people in your life that gave you the grit, all right? Oh. Your coaches, your teachers, your mom, your dad, the community leaders, the folks that, that put those nuggets, you know, into your mind and in your heart that you could pull out from that toolbox and allow you not only to thrive, but even survive uh, uh, through this, this experience. And so... <clears throat> And so that's that's how I came up with the metaphor, and that's why I call you a parachute packer. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah, I, I love that. I promise I'm not going to put any holes in your parachute ever. <laughs> I promise. Uh, I'll just leave that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Oh, I just I love hearing these stories because you really do give people an inspiration to, um, you know, mindset is everything. Everything. I just you know the the, the power of you actually being there as long as you were you were able there's so many good stories you're such an incredible speaker and we get a lot of your stories on linkedin people can go in and follow you on linkedin see your a pair a pow talks about mm -hmm. great little moments minute long little there's it's just um you know again it goes to anything you do in life right you have mm -hmm. to have the right attitude and your stories charlie have really taught me so much and you know we've had some wonderful times whether it be you know out in Necker Island or on a boat, on a, boat <laughs> a few <laughs> boats matter or of fact we, we, we've we've done a lot we've had some fun we, we have. have had some fun and Thank you know you. but it's it's been always um I think about your mindset as Mindy says you know and that is so important to be able to look um at a perspective and understand that, you know, you just can't judge everything by feeling sorry for yourself. You have to turn it around and figure out a way that you're going to be able to, to thrive, not just survive, as you said, you know. And so you're just a living, breathing example of, <laughs> of what a lot of us in this world are going through, uh, whether, again, it's a business issue, a family issue, or whether it's today in, in issues that, you know, the whole world are going through, that we have to all realize that, you know, you get through it with a strong mind. It's very true. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in each other. You know, you have to have that trust. Uh, and you have that mindset. And then get creative, you know? And, right. and, and you know more about creativity than about anybody I know. I'm learning about TikTok. That's yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, yeah, okay. I saw many dancing on t TikTok. I'm, more, I'm learning that whole world. You know what? There's, we're all, we all have room to grow, right? <laughs> no, you did good. You sound oh, you, you look good there. Thank you, you see, Captain. There's a gift we got from Charlie, Oh, too, I know. I love this vase. We keep this. And I brought it with me because we just took it off. This is, a, these are all part, this is all part of your history, too, right? It is. As a matter of fact, uh, this uh, is a decanter uh, that it's all of the airplanes that I flew, all the squadrons that I was in. It's uh, it, it was actually done for the hundredth anniversary for Naval Aviation. Oh, that's and, um, nice. well, that's thank cool. you for that. Thanks. You know what, Charlie? I hate that our time is wrapping up, but I am just so grateful you took some time to stop in and visit us and. Captain Charlie Plum, go to your if you want to read the book. I am no hero. Go to charlieplum.com. You mm -hmm. continue to do incredible things. I wish you go to a lot of corporate events when corporations are back having events. Uh, I will. I'm sure you'll be in there again, <laughs> speaking and inspiring, and on LinkedIn and other places we can catch you and Facebook. And you know what? Thank you for sharing your stories of grit. Thank you for your friendship, and uh, you just keep 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 doing what you do because we are honored to know you. Let me tell Thank you, you for I, your service. I, I, I'm very thankful and honored that you'd help me tell this story. Charlie, we absolutely uh, are so privileged to have been a friend of yours, and we appreciate you. And, and again, you know, I just started this mm -hmm. because of a lot of people asking, and I thought, who would we want, you know? And again... Here you go. So we really first appreciate guest. it. You Our are. First. So thank you. I love this quote as I go. There's a great one. It says, challenges are what make life interesting, but overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. Mm. And I think mm. you have lived a very meaningful life. So thank, thank you, you Charlie. Thank you. Follow us on uh, YouTube and Apple Podcasts and uh, Facebook. Grit Happens. This has been Grit Happens with Glenn and Mindy. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Be well. Stay safe. Captain. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Charlie. Appreciate it.